Hello and welcome to today's program at the Town Hall, Demanding Space, Suffrage, Politics, and Power in the 20th Century. My name is Malaya Rai, I'm the host of tonight's edition of Century of Story and Song at the Town Hall. Uh, we've got a great topic tonight that's really close to the root and the core of what our hall's mission is. We are talking about early 20th century uh, women's struggle and women's struggle for the vote in particular. Um, as many of you may know, the town hall was founded by the League for Political Education. The League for Political Education was founded by suffragists in 1894 in response to the defeat at the New York State Constitutional Convention. Uh, they founded the League because they believed that low and no cost adult education would raise political consciousness and that an educated electorate was integral to the fight for women's suffrage. The six women founders of the League met for the first time at the home of Eleanor Butler Sanders. In the two decades that followed, they built up a cultural institution that could no longer jump from hall to hall for programming. The group need a permanent home. That home became our hall today, the Town Hall. The other founding members were Dr. Mary Putnam Jacoby, Lee Wood Hagen, uh, Karen A.B. Abbey, Lucia Gilbert Runkle, and Adele Marion Field. Uh, the town hall itself was founded by the League uh, for Political Education in 1921 by the same group of suffragists. And over the course of the next 99 years, many people to, came to the hall, many educators, many philosophers, many uh, politicians, and of course, many, 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 many great artists uh, came to organize, to perform, um, and often to raise consciousness about different political causes. So. With that, I'm so excited in the 100th anniversary um, of the 90th, 19th Amendment ratification and just a few months before our centennial, uh, which will be in January 2021. I'm so glad to have Dr. Lauren C. Antangelo and Paula C. Austin. I hadn't noticed the C's thing. Um, I'm so happy to have them here this evening to speak to us about women's organizing at the turn of the century. Uh, I'll start with a couple of bios. Uh, Professor Dr. Lauren C. Santangelo is a historian, teacher, and the author of Suffrage and the City, New York Women Battle for the Ballot. They are a lecturer in the writing program at Princeton University and are developing a digital humanities suffrage project. Santangelo's most recent research, supported by an NEH fellowship from the New York Historical Society, examines the experiences and resilience of young Italian-American survivors of sexual assault in the 1920s. Thank you, Lauren, for joining us. And we have Dr. Paula C. Austin, uh, who is an assistant professor of history and African-American studies at Boston University. She writes and teaches about black visual culture, African-American and civil rights history, and facilitates faculty professional development on diversity, equity, and inclusion. I'm sure she's very busy in 2020 with that. Um, thank you both so much for joining. And uh, let's, let's bring you on to start the conversation. Thank you. Hello, how are you Hi. doing today? Good. Thanks for having me. Thanks for joining, Paul. Yeah, thanks for having us. I feel like now we should talk about what the C's stand for, but we, we don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, wait, C, 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 C. Um, it was so lovely. I, I reached out to Lauren because of their work and I'd seen um, the mapping project. I said, well, okay, well, Lauren, who, who could speak with you? And when they said, Paul Austin, Paul Austin from the Schomburg? <laughs> It was such a delight. So thank you so much for coming. It feels like full circle. Well, I want to ask, because, you know, uh, we have this little circle thing going, Lauren and Paula, how do you know each other? Where have you, where have you met before? Because I know you've been talking <laughs> to each other a lot. Um, yeah. So Paula and I went to grad school together. Um, mm -hmm. And um, we met early on in our graduate school careers and have collaborated and thought together and talked together um, 
for what? Uh, a decade now? Polo? I don't know. I'm a bad historian of my yeah, own history. No, I think that's, I think about a decade. <laughs> About yeah. a decade. Yeah, we were at the CUNY Graduate Center yeah. together. Um, we're both New Yorkers. Mm -hmm. uh, different parts of New York, though. Mm -hmm. I'm just mm -hmm. going to make that yeah. clear. Oh. Um, yeah, there's a little bit. We can talk <laughs> about that later. Um, but yeah, so we were we met at the CUNY Graduate Center and um, went to a bunch of conferences together. And then I think in, I don't know, I'm not sure when that conference was, Lauren, but we essentially went to a conference together and then we're on a group chat. Like it, that so was I think we've the been DT on that, one, yeah. We've yeah. been in a group chat for about six years. Per, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. that's, that's, right. where, that's where papers are being written. <laughs> <laughs> Ideas are being debated. Uh, yeah, it's really it was um, really covered the spectrum the the group discussions there, <laughs> from important things to less important things. So yeah, we've known each other for a while. And your work also interacts, right? You're often thinking about some of the same things, so. Can you speak a bit to that? Well, Lauren was was working on their project before I was, was working on the dissertation and then the book before I was working on my dissertation and the book. But we definitely had a lot of conversations about um, organizing, about organizing strategies and tactics, about use of urban space. I mean, Lauren's book is about New York City. Um, my book is about DC mm -hmm. at you know, kind of it, it, uh, rotating in the same uh, time frames, and so we talked a lot about um, how the women in uh, suffrage in the city used space. I talked. I was talking mm -hmm. about how young people were using space in D.C. And so, yeah, I mean, we. I think we had a lot of different conversations: gender, gender identity, mm -hmm. um, intersectionality. Yeah. You know, we were we were sort of talking about methodologies yeah. in, in using our sources, how we were using our sources. Um, yeah. Yeah, I was just, yeah, just to add to that, I think we had a lot of conversations about even just literature we were reading and things that were kind of striking us um, that there was just a lot of conceptual and methodological overlap um, that I think really uh, helped my book at the least to kind of talk it through uh, with Paula and get her feedback on it um, <laughs> regularly. Um, so uh, yeah, there's just, we think a lot about um, bodies in space, I think. Yeah, and we read each other's work. Yeah. Uh, a lot of times. <laughs> we did. <laughs> uh, and I'm very grateful for that. I appreciate it. As am I, yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, everything you talked about, um, is what we're gonna talk about today. <laughs> so we're talking about mapping and feminism intersectionality, um, women in urban spaces. So I'd love to start, I'm so excited to just pick y'all's brain for the next hour. Um, well, let's start with the, just a basic understanding of what the late 19th century and early 20th century were like. Like, what do we need to know? Can you please just set up the scene for us? Sure. Um, I think this is a big question. Um, so uh, a couple themes, maybe I'll throw out a couple and Paul, you could add and we'll see if we kind of between us can get it all covered. Um, I think of this time period, which I think um, historians would call the Gilded Age and progressive era, right? The late 19th and early 20th century, and then into the 1920s and the 1930s, because uh, Paul's book uh, really kind of focuses us on the 1930s, um, is a time period of industrialization, um, corp rise of corporations, um, and then responses to those um, changes in terms of um, working class activism and unionization. Um, Paula, let me let you jump in and then we could circle back to some of the other things that I'm thinking about. Yeah, I mean, so yes, we've got all of that kind of growing, um, mm -hmm. a further growth of infrastructure, especially in urban spaces mm -hmm. um, and uh, absolutely workers' rights activism. I mean, you know, the famous uh, Black historian Rayford Logan also called it the nadir in in uh, Black history. So it's also a time of mm -hmm. um, heightened racial violence uh, and racial terror, uh, the onset of Jim Crow racial segregation, um, kind of cemented by the Plessy versus Ferguson Supreme Court decision. You know, I was thinking too about um, how it was also this. Um, sort of important shift that's happening disciplinarily in terms of 
a kind of movement away from biological determinism mm. to kind of more cultural, I mean, determinism to some extent. And I was really thinking about this in terms of the ways that um, that social Darwin is a kind of a, a, um, a mobilization of social mm. Darwinism kind of helps both um, uh, white women suffragists, but also uh, black activists who are kind of paying attention to uh, this, the hierarchy of civilization that's been set up and kind of trying to figure out how they're gonna use that to garner and expand, you know, to expand rights and to kind of garner uh, citizenship. Yeah, um, and just to kind of um, piggyback on that, I guess, I, some of the other things would be related would be um, in terms of the building of institutions. Um, I'm thinking about the club movement that happens in the late 19th century and early 20th century. Um, the Women's Trade Union League, um, the National Associ Association of Colored Women, um, the Women's Christian Temperance Union, I think is 1873, the kind of rise of um, colleges for women and opening up of professions for women. I'm thinking about um, increasingly medicine uh, and uh, law. Um, uh, I don't know if you wanna add anything to that. I'm also thinking about vis visual culture. Um, uh, and like the changes in visual culture and consumerism that is happening at this time period. It's such kind of a dynamic time period where we're getting all of these um, changes happening. Um, we didn't even really kind of talk about immigration at this moment, um, but also that. Um, uh, yeah, sorry. I mean, the, the fact that we have images of, yeah. um, the, of the growth in institutional life uh, yeah. for African-Americans, for women, um, is kind of evidence of this shift that's happening technologically in yeah. terms of visual culture, photography, film. I mean, there, there are a bunch of sort of political, um, economic, uh, legal changes that are happening in the country, but also all of these cultural shifts. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, um, I'm just thinking if like, I have a good story that I could tell that's kind of that it's a, a little bit of um, some evidence of, of some of these I, that I, kind of bring together the, the organizing. Um, I was thinking of um, Ida B. Wells and uh, the kind of the beginning, maybe to some extent, of her anti lynching campaign and the mm -hmm. publication of Southern Horrors yeah. in 1892 and the way that she she sort of kicked out. Um, of Memphis, you know, after uh, Thomas Lyons, Lyons is is killed, is murdered, and she begins to, you know, use her newspaper to articulate. So that's the other thing that's growing. Print culture yep. is growing. Yep. Black newspapers. Mm -hmm. um, but she comes to New York, and uh, and she begins to kind of participate in that that institutional, cultural, artistic life that's happening in New York, um, specifically with Black women, but not only Black women, mm -hmm. um, and. Uh, and they, a group of women come together uh, and they they kind of give her a platform to talk about what she's been writing about and researching. And, um, and she appears in front of like 250 women at Lyric Hall in, uh, in Bryant Park. And, and it's out of that, that that she is able to raise the money to publish Southern Horrors. And, uh, and it's out of that, some, some six years later, that many of those women who came together to give her that platform at Lyric Hall then organized the first um, chapter of the NACW, the National Association of Colored Women. Right, yeah. Um, yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, I, that, thank you for providing like the substantive evidence to, uh, to explore that. So that's a little bit of like the backdrop of yeah. uh, kind of the the what becomes the the work to to get the um, uh, the state referendum to yeah. and then that kind of builds into what becomes the what you know the kind of multifaceted New York suffrage movement. Yeah, I'm trying to think if we're if we're kind of missing anything. I was thinking of the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire in 1911 too as an example of kind of. Um, industrialization and um, working class kind of um, uh, trying to kind of gain um, rights within a system that isn't necessarily meant to uh, advocate for them or isn't meant at all to advocate for them. So yeah, that I think uh, does a nice job of laying the groundwork for us um, in terms of thinking about what's happening in the late 19th and early yeah. 20th century. I mean, maybe that takes us to the league itself to the formation of the league? 
Sure. Yeah. Um, we can talk about that. Um, so, uh, so the, as, um, we got in that really kind of wonderful introduction. Um, the um, the League for Political Education starts in 1894, um, and I thought I would kind of uh, go back a little bit um, to think about why it starts in 1894 and do a little contextualizing for us. Um, so uh, 1894 is the year of a New York State Constitutional Convention. There can be voted to have every 20 years. Um, and so there's one in 1894, um, and there are organizers like uh, the, there are organizers like uh, Susan B. Anthony, uh, Lily Devereaux Blake of the New York City Women's Suffrage League, who are really excited by this opportunity, who see it as an opportunity to um, amend the state constitution um, in an easier way than generally exists, because generally they would have to go through two legislatures um, and then it would have to get voted on um, the amendment. And in this case, it just needs to get approved, just in quotes, right? Uh, it just needs to get approved by the convention and then um, the electorate would have to vote on it. So it's uh, the threshold is slightly seen as slightly um, not as demanding as uh, a regular legislative session. Um, so there's all this excitement about it. Uh, Susan B. Anthony, the New York City Women's Suffrage League, there's all this organizing, there's canvassing, there's petitioning happening. Um, and I think what takes people by surprise, long-term uh, organizers by surprise in 1894 is, um, and journalists by surprise, uh, is that there are a group of really wealthy individuals, wealthy um, women who get involved, um, People like uh, Margaret Chandler Aldrich, who um, is a member of the Astor family, uh, Margaret Olivia Sage, Laura Rockefeller, um, some of the women whose, name, whose names we heard at the beginning, right, get together. And <clears throat> those women, under really kind of the leadership of Mary Putnam Jacoby, form um, what's called the Volunteer Committee at that moment. It's for, uh, so it's a group of elite women who are pushing forward suffrage. Um, and it's really kind of the first time in New York City that I think we see elite women kind of throwing their um, clout behind um, an amendment. Uh, it's not, well, let me say one thing first. The other thing that's really interesting to me about 1894 is spatially what happens, and that is the volunteer committee kind of takes over Sherry's, which is this um, restaurant, elite restaurant in the late 19th century and makes it uh, suffrage headquarters um, for the volunteer committee. And here you could kind of see an image of it. And I really kind of like the disconnect that exists between the like fancy ladies um, being so kind of focused on the political action and then like the paperwork on the floor um, being ignored. Um, so we get this kind of um, real interest. And as I said, journalists think it's a fad that these women are just kind of, they, I think they literally say they're bored, right? They, they just want to do this temporarily. They're not in here for the long term. Um, and I think, I mean, so it fails in 1894. New York State's constitution isn't changed until uh, 1917 to get rid of gender as a criteria for voting. Um, fails in 1894 and the volunteer committee then morphs into the league for political education um which takes on kind of a doesn't make suffrage the key priority takes on um kind of a civ civic education um priorities so in some ways some of the individuals remain involved but they're definitely um not as i think visible is the word i want to use as they are in 1894 later on um, so that's um, 1894. And I think the thing that's interesting to me about 1894 is twofold. Is one, there, um, we, it's a moment and there's going to be lots of moments and hopefully we get to talk about these of tension between different groups of women. So um, the elite women the of the volunteer committee um, and um, the kind of uh, white middle class women of the New York City Women's Suffrage League. There's a little bit of tension between. Um, and it's also a moment where I think space is being used in an interesting way in that Sherry's is being um, used as a um, as a space to kind of draw in individuals, right? And to underscore the prestige of this message. Um, so it's just kind of this really interesting snapshot of a moment in suffrage history. And I mean, we could talk a little bit um, about how those those strategies change over the next decade or so. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, I'm wondering if, yes, yes. could you, would you sure. share some of that? Mostly because I was thinking about, which I know we did not really talk about when we were kind of preparing for this, but I, um, one of the things I was thinking about was the the um, Statue of Liberty <laughs> protest, yeah. uh, mostly because when I was thinking about the contemporary moment, yeah. I was thinking about the Statue of Liberty protest that happened in 2018 um, with Patricia Okomu, who, who, you know, did the protest with Rise and Resist, was arrested, um, and the kind of use of the Statue of Liberty and the, the meaning of the Statue of Liberty. So, so yeah, let's, we could talk about kind of how um, the activists that you are, that you talk about in the book are using space differently. And, and I think how their relationship to New York City space mm -hmm. changes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, um... So that's going backwards in time. Uh, the Statue of Liberty is 1886, um, <laughs> but I, I, I like the story and I appreciate you bringing it up. So let me uh, briefly outline it. So in 1886, the Statue of Liberty is unveiled and um, individuals in the New York City Women's Suffrage League are kind of ticked that they're not included in the day's program. Officially, there's like this big event. New York City basically um, kind of takes, um, takes a day off to celebrate the unveiling of the Statue of Liberty. Um, and, and again, suffragists are angry that they're not included. Uh, so they actually, uh, charter a boat. I think it's a cattle barge. They have like no money left in, um, their treasury. So they kind of get the cheapest vessel there is. Um, and they hold a protest, um, outside of the official ceremonies of the Statue of Liberty kind of, um, criticizing the fact that the Statue of Liberty is embodied as a woman in a place, in a, in a country where women can't vote. Um, so they use it in the, its message to try to highlight an inconsistency. Um, notably, they don't disembark at that moment, um, which is different than what happens in like 1910, 1911, 1912, where we start to see activists kind of really using um, public spaces and the streets um, much more uh, rigorously, I guess is the word I want to say. There's kind of a real change in strategy there. Um, from 1894, where it's like mostly in commercial sheltered spaces, and then 1910, 1911, where we're seeing a lot of street action. Um, yeah, do you want to throw up the, yeah, cool. Um, thank you. Um, so this is kind of an indication of the change that happens, if you can imagine the previous uh, image, right, of um, Sherry's um, versus um, this image of 1911, um, which is Wall Street. Uh, and it looks, I mean, from the image itself, it looks like it's going well. Um, we know it's more complicated than that. Um, so uh, this the kind of backstory here is the first open air meeting, suffrage open air meeting in New York City is 1907, I believe, in Madison Square Park. Um, they become more um, frequent as the years progress, although there is certainly opposition among uh, organizers, some organizers to them. Um, this isn't the first time they've held a meeting at Wall Street. They uh, held a meeting, I think, in 1908, and it goes poorly there. Um, and in 1911, there's this one where um, we have Anna Howard Shaw, um, Pankhurst, um, and Harry Stanley Blatch. So three white, relatively well-known women going down to Wall Street to try to convert the men. I mean, you could see all the men there um, to suffrage. Um, and it's not the reception I think they hope to receive. Um, they are, they try to talk to the crowd, the crowd drowns them out. Um, ultimately they are, they say like, if you actually wanna hear us then hire a, we'll hire a hall and you could hear us. And of course the crowd chants back, hire a hall, hire a hall. Um, mm -hmm. Not in a like supportive way that we want to hear you, but in like a get out of the space sort of way. Uh, and I think this is a real indication of the ways in which public space wasn't public for everyone, right? This is like a masculinized territory um, and they're being chased out of it. Uh, and we could talk more about um, this event and what happens afterwards if we want, but I'd like to kind of um, pause and see if there's other questions that we want to move on to. Well, I mean, I, one question that I have, uh, given everything you've sort of uh, spoken about in terms of New York um, and women in New York is, I mean, who 
who, what woman feels that she can do this in New York, <laughs> feels that she will be safe doing this, that she will be, she won't be, um, yeah, I mean, what kind of woman feels that she won't be apprehended by the state in doing something like this? Or if she's, you know, obviously some women uh, as, as part of spectacle would try to vote to be arrested. Mm -hmm. Different women can do that with different mm -hmm. states. Yeah. So can you speak to um, sure. what the move to the public um, means for so many women? And then of course, I mean, so far we've talked about like aristocrats and middle mm -hmm. class. Yeah. So where are yeah. you yeah. working A very small here? segment. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Uh, great. So thank you. I was hoping we would kind of get into um, the kind of larger coalition for vo voting rights. But to your point, I think, yeah. Um, we need to think uh, carefully about uh, race and class privileges here. What's notable to me about that Wall Street story is actually part is the masculinized space, right? There's this mm -hmm. public space that they're being chased out of. But then what happens is that um, those individuals go to the police and they complain that there wasn't enough police protection there. And they demand that they're going to go back in a week and the police um, need to be there to control um, and create order. Mm -hmm. um, and there is a greater police presence the second time, and it is more orderly. So it uh, raises questions about whose bodies get to call on state resources that I think mm -hmm. um, we should uh, think critically about. Um, so thank you for raising that question because it allowed me to tell the second part of that story. Well, my other question is also, you know, we're talking New York, so there's lots of labor work being done yep. as well and labor protests. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to think of, are there women who have already been somewhat politically active because they're taking part in labor movements mm -hmm. or in labor protests, but haven't necessarily taken up space as women who wanted to vote or for who that was like a, a particularly? Yeah, I mean, I think there, I mean, I think there are definitely organizations that are trying to transcend um, class divides that exist. Um, there's efforts by organizations like the Women's Suffrage Party to um, uh, increase the number of um, working class individuals. And there's working class individuals who are trying to like combat the um, normative assumptions about womenhood that leadership is making. So one of the stories I could tell is about uh, Leonora O'Reilly, who is up in Albany, and she is like a union activist She and a suffragist. Um, and she goes up to Albany, and she's speaking for suffrage in front of the legislature. And she says something and she, uh, like, and she points to the anti-suffragist in the crowd. She says something like, you all believe in chivalry, right? But I ride the subway as a way to be like, we need to question your normative notions of womanhood and what they're uh, based on. So um, I'm not sure if that exactly answers your question, mm -hmm. um, but I think it's an example of um, problematizing or making visible assumptions. Well, I mean, something that I definitely want to talk to talk to both of you about is some of the differences between and the resistance and the tensions um, amongst and, and within different voting rights related groups or women's organizations, women's clubs. So, you know, we're sort of already getting into mm, critiques right. of what we think of as women's suffrage, which is right. really like white women's suffrage of this mm -hmm. era. Um, but there's also splits amongst abolitionists. There's so many, there's so many different, I don't want to say flavors, but like, there's so many different organizations. And so I was wondering if both of you, look, Paula, if you wouldn't mind jumping in, just like what, what else are we missing when we just think, of, think about some of these, um, or just a few of these organizations who are really well known? Yeah, I mean, maybe we can look at the at the um, the a suffrage parade that happens in D.C. and and talk a little bit about um, yeah. uh, Ida B. Wells. But you know, I was also thinking about uh, Lauren in your book where mm -hmm. you talk about the attempts to to get more support from other sort of non elite uh, women, mm -hmm. a, a wide kind of you know mm -hmm. swath. And I think the you know what I understood from your book was that those uh, white middle and upper class women understood that they needed, you know, critical mass and yep. understood, you know, that they needed to kind of come up with some organizing strategies mm -hmm. that that at least attempted to include yeah. uh, working class women, immigrant yeah. women who were also working class women. Yeah. Right. So I think yeah. I, I thought it was interesting to think about um, uh, the way that they were mobilizing yep. particular strategies, uh, given that they had assumptions about who these women were. Uh, 
Yeah, yeah I was going to say, do you remember when I uh, had all those flyers translated from the National American Women's Suffrage Association? Uh, I was just thinking of the story, Paula lived through this, where <laughs> I had all, there was all these uh, flyers in different languages um, by the, I think the National American Women's Suffrage Association that I was fortunate enough to get a grant to hire uh, translators for, um, thinking that I would really kind of get at the different messages that were being conveyed. And then I realized that they were all kind of the same flyer, just in different languages. Um, so it's clear that they're like, uh, there's an effort to reach, uh, as Paul is saying, a larger kind of mass of people. Um, and I think we could think about those strategies a little bit more, but I always come back to that moment of, um, <laughs> it was like I was like chasing something down, down a rabbit hole, right? And then it was um, the, the same uh, argument. <laughs> Yeah, I think, you know, I think what's been interesting for me is um, in looking at black women organizing in this early period that their their organizing is so um, multi issue. So there is some discussion of I mean, and there are specific suffrage organizations. I mean, uh, Ida B. Wells uh, starts kind of, you know, one of the um, many suffrage specific organizations, um, the Alpha S Suffrage Club, but there are other, you know, state suffrage organizations that are um, organized by black women in Montana and North Dakota. Uh, but, but they are doing, while they are uh, doing suffrage work and absolutely are interested in uh, getting access to the franchise, um, given that there is already voter suppression of black men, after the 15th amendment so in the late uh in the late 19th and and then well into the 20th uh, century we've got sort of you know enormous amounts of voter suppression that is predominantly around you know into use of intimidation and um, other kinds of violence but most black women are doing multi-issue organizing and i think some of that is true for for white ethnic and white working class women is that absolutely the, the franchise it's important, but it is as important as working conditions, as, you know, pay equity, mm -hmm. um, you know, as uh, protection from sexual violence and sexual abuse at the workplace. Mm -hmm. So all of those things are, um, yeah, all of those things are, are equally important for, for women uh, who are organizing, who are um, working, poor and working class. So, I'll just, sorry, yeah, can I? I, I was mm -hmm. just going to uh, tell a story about a socialist in New York City who refused the National American Women's Suffrage Association's effort for collaboration because they're like, we believe in voting rights. Like, this is something we champion and believe with, but we actually don't want to, like, our kind of our... Um, our leadership and who we want to charge, like it's different and they don't want to be kind of um, mm -hmm. directed by, I think they call it the capitalistic class. So that's another example. Yeah. To just and I think that's it. true. That is definitely true. There is are, are at least one example of a black women's organization with the essentially saying the same thing. Mm. Well, if you wouldn't mind uh, speaking about the National Association of Colored Women Clubs a bit, because uh, I know we were just talking about Ida B. Wells and multi-issue organizations. I don't think everybody necessarily knows that much about them. I love this, by the way. Ugh. <laughs> oh, we lost oh, a poll. You're, you're muted. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, yes, Lifting As We Climb. I was excited about Lifting As We Climb, um, <laughs> which was the uh, National uh, Association of Colored Women's uh, motto and mantra, maybe. Both of those things work. Um, and yeah, so they really form after the first uh, sort of chapter of the organization forms um, in New York as a result of this organizing that's done to do some fundraising for Ida B. Wells' uh, Southern Horrors. And it actually brings together these women who, um, some Brooklyn, Black Brooklyn activists and uh, New York City, Manhattan uh, um, Black activists who were you know, not necessarily friends, uh, sort of, at, you know, had some um, issues with each other, but they come together to do this, To sh they show up for uh, the Wells event and they end up doing a bunch of fundraising so that she can publish uh, Southern Horrors, you know, and make all these copies because that's how, that's what publishing was for <laughs> Southern Horrors. It was essentially just like a bunch of copies were made. Um, and uh, and they and six years later, they form the first uh, that I think I think the first um, organization um, chapter of the National Association of Colored Women. But 
they definitely had, they were, there were chapters all over the country and um, they definitely had a sort of um, multi-issue organizing platform. Um, they were working against, uh, you know, lynching. They were working against uh, police brutality. They were working for pay equity. They were looking at working conditions, but they also had, um, you know, they were, they were um, sort of calling for reform to criminal legal system. So it was really kind of, you know, everything um, under the sun, all the kind of facets of uh, racial violence and discrimination. Uh, they were calling for an end to uh, segregation. They were absolutely you know, um, insisting on black men's right to vote. I mean, they organized um, sort of protective units that would escort their husbands and sons and uncles and, you know, grandfathers to the, to the polls, you know, sometimes they were armed. So um, they were doing kind of multiple things at the same time. They had a really broad uh, platform. And I'm just looking at the chapters, um, Tuskegee, St. Louis, um, uh, Louisiana, Los Angeles, Memphis, Boston, Charleston. Um, and, you know, I was thinking, Lauren, to something that you were talking about, uh, about the league, but many of them felt that even the ones that were not suffrage specific were also doing voter education, um, that this was a, an integral part to the work that they were doing. I mean, it, you know, they were starting settlement houses, they were organizing food drives, but that kind of aspect of political education, political engagement, civic education was incredibly important for, uh, for the um, National Association of Colored Women chapters. Well, something else um, that you hipped me to, but I might've gone in the wrong direction <laughs> with, was that there were crisis issues um, on suffrage. And if you wouldn't mind speaking to, I mean, I was looking at the 1912, but. <laughs> well, there were multiple crisis. Uh, yeah, well, that's, that's, yeah, that's, that's, that's the takeaway, crisis. I think, right? Yeah, <laughs> that's the takeaway. Um, yeah, um, so I could, uh, I could feel this uh, a little bit and then pull out free, free to jump well, I'll in. Give, um, yeah, I'll just say yeah, that, the, that, you know, that the crisis is really an example of sort of what we were talking about in the beginning about kind of the what's the backdrop. But the crisis is the, um, the, the sort of newsletter, the magazine of the NAACP, which forms in 1906 and comes out of a kind of convention of um, the of the Niagara movement mm -hmm. uh, that was uh, predominantly black men, and then the and then the NAAC forms and is uh, multiracial, you know, include both men and women. Um, and then the the crisis is kind of where they're publishing this, and they're it's you know they're sort of doing cultural stuff, but also sort of hard hitting news. Yeah, and as we just to kind of um, add to that, as we see that there's this one issue um, that um, exists, and then there's another, at least another one in 1915, which is the one that I had been thinking of, where um, prominent Black individuals, Black activists are interviewed on their position on suffrage, and it's a women's suffrage edition that is like um, supporting uh, the uh, drive for um, constitutional change. Um, so, I mean, I think there are overlaps between um, the NAACP and the NAWSA in terms of even individual overlaps um, that are kind of worth exploring. And the Women's Suffrage Party itself, who is one of like the organizing, one of the key kind of, um, one of the key kind of figures, uh, organizations for the suffrage movement in New York City in the early 1910s actually uh, is really happy with the crisis issue and I think requests several hundred copies to distribute amongst um, their uh, supporters. Um, so there's there's kind of inter-institutional um, inter dialogue that happens. Inter, intra, inter, in inter, 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 inter. <laughs> Well, the other thing that I thought was interesting about this issue is that um, so men of the month was something that the crisis did regularly. Um, and on the men of the month for this issue is Mary Church Terrell. Yeah. So that's great. <laughs> ah. <laughs> I know. I love I mean, that. Yeah. I mean, and of course, she is a prominent yeah. um, uh, suffrage advocate, but she's also, you know, she's like in the the 
peace talks. She's sort of everywhere doing every kind of political activism um, you could think of. Yeah, I, I love that. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, um, so, I mean, the other thing I would add is, um, is the, so I think there's also a critique of many of these early organiza early black mm -hmm. organizations, so NAACP and the National Association of Colored Women. And I think this is true also for many of the uh, sort of white social reform organizations, you know, the folks who are putting up the settlement houses, et cetera, um, that there is this idea about um, attempting to uh, sort of fix poor and working class people and their communities. Um, and women are seen as an incredibly important part of it. I mean, this is where I think the like mobilization of uh, social Darwinism, even though it's kind of going out of fashion, you know, sort of disciplinarily and academically, um, the idea is that, uh, and I think Lauren, you talk a little bit about this in terms of the mobilization of a particular ideology about women kind of being able to bring some morality to the political world um, mm -hmm. once they be, you know, once they get the vote and they're, they're voters. But I think this is definitely mobilized in, um, organizations like the National Association of Colored Women, whose membership is predominantly um, who we would call middle class black women. Um, many of them are sort of wives of professional black men or professionals themselves. You know, it's aspirationally middle class if we compare it to what the white middle class looks like at that point. But um, but they are, you know, sort of they're predominantly educated, right? They've been educated. They've probably been to college. Um, and they are in sort of these professional jobs, but they're, they absolutely kind of mobilize what we would call now respectability politics that's kind of based in um, morality and a, a particular kind of Christianity. Um, but really with this idea that, uh, that sort of behavior and aesthetics and um, a kind of, you know, a certain practice of citizenship will necessarily garner um, political and uh, political rights and social equality, which we know didn't didn't work um, and maybe doesn't work. Uh, but I think the I think this is absolutely a, a an activist strategy at the time from from lots of different people. Yeah, are you are you like thinking about uh, municipal housekeeping to that idea of municipal housekeeping? Um, which is essentially, uh, I should have sent the image to you, um, but this idea that with the vote, um, women can protect the home um, from, I have this image of a baby at the door with germs coming in. Um, and the idea is that with the vote, women could kind of protect the baby from the germs. Um, this, <laughs> this idea that like women will improve the world around them. Well, isn't there also the idea that um, when women, when women, and I think the assumption is when white women vote, that the electorate gets better. You know, that it's like it's raising the electorate. Yeah, I when mean, a certain I, kind of woman is able to vote. Yeah, you see that explicitly. I mean, you see that in 1894, and I see it again in um, 1915. Um, even leading up to 1915, where the argument is is explicitly that um, the enfranchise changing the constitution will improve the quality of the vote um meaning yeah. more white native born women will vote than the quote quality of the vote and this is a, an argument that is made to journalists um did i yeah. quality versus quantity i uh, yeah, yeah okay um <clears throat> so um yeah i think that's exactly right and something that uh, happens in 1894 and despite all of the changes that we see between 1894 and like 1915 it's uh, an argument that uh kind of is, it comes up throughout the campaign, campaign. Well, we, have, we have a question that i think um we can take right now how central was religion in these various veins of social justice activism that's from thomas yeah, I, I mean, I would say, I mean, in terms of the work that black activists are doing, definitely central. I mean, there, I mean, there is some disagreement. There are some black activists who are not um, sort of putting it at the forefront uh, in terms of the organizing. But I would say the way that it comes through is is through um, the kind of mobilization of morality and a particular kind of Christianity um, to kind of combat the, the 
the violence that uh, we don't fully have the kind of, we don't have the images of the violence that we do certainly in the kind of traditional civil rights movement, but we definitely have photographs of, I mean, I'm thinking about, you know, that Wells uses photographs that are traveling around in a kind of entertaining fashion of uh, lynching victims to talk about the um, barbarousness and the inhumanity of those white mobs and really kind of calling out whether or not they are, whether or not they should be able to call themselves Christians, whether or not they are Christians. So absolutely looking at that kind of, you know, racial violence and racial terror, um, but also, you know, thinking about uh, poverty, thinking about, um, you know, economic discrimination and, and subsequent poverty uh, as these moral um, things. It's, it's incredibly messy to use that argument, though, for, I mean, I'm thinking about um, uh, Black activism of the time. And I don't know if this is true, Lauren, for the folks that you look at. I think it's a little bit messy because while it is calling out um, sort of structural violence, it also kind of blames the victim, right? It has, it, it always sort of like, you know, morphs in, it has a little bit of victim blame in it. Um, and so I think that's, that is always the trouble with the, with that, with the kind of use of a, a sort of moral argument. Mm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And do you, if, if both of you wouldn't mind answering this, do you think that um, different uh, religious dogma uh, so, for example, Catholic first versus Baptist, or I'm really thinking Catholic first, a lot of the different Protestant denominations, um, changes the way that certain groups of women organize? Or is there, you know, I'm trying to think of, do I know of any, personally, me just as someone who's not well versed in all this, do I know of any like major Catholic suffragists or organizations that were dominated by Catholic suffragists? And I, I just ask that because almost everyone that I can think of off the top of my head is a Protestant. Hmm. Is, yeah. I mean, about our country, but I'm thinking about New York and I'm like, that can't be so, that we're New York City. Yeah, I'm trying, it's interesting because I'm trying to think about the role religion plays in um, the, in various New York City organizations. And my memory, I'd have to go back. This is pushing my memory a little bit, um, but I think, and I don't, I could be wrong here. So it's possible I'm wrong, but I feel like the last uh, bit of the history of women's suffrage on New York ends with the discussion of a Catholic organization. Um, and I think um, we also, um, like Rabbi Stephen Wise is an advocate of suffrage uh, mm. and a leader in suffrage, Leon Wald. So um, I don't know that we wanna think about like just um, Catholic versus Protestant either, yeah. right? I would complicate that a little bit. Um, I was interesting because I was reading, uh, Paul and I did something recently on Massachusetts, um, and it was talking a lot about what I was reading, um, which I think was Barbara Berenson's book on Massachusetts suffrage, was talking, I think it was Barbara Berenson's book, uh, about um, how um, there was kind of an assumption that um, the Dem uh, Catholic Democrats would be against um, suffrage. Um, mm. And I think there's a, an assumption just generally that immigrants are going to be against suffrage, right? Um, right? So there's kind of like intersectionality there um, that like immigrants generally would be following old world traditions, right? And not yeah. believe in these changes. Um, so that's not yeah, really it, a direct answer to your yeah. question, but like there's some- there's also like it, immigrants are where the religious diversity comes in, mm -hmm. right? When we're talking about the turn of the century, that's yeah. like- yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Thank you for. No, no. I just. just yeah. Wait. Hey, what am I? Why am I asking that? At the turn of century, everybody who's not Protestant is, is like just got here. Um, not everybody. But I yeah. No. But I think. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there um, is this assumption that um, immigrants would not support the the vote. Um, which I think complicates approaches to the city and resource allocation in the city. Mm. And that's also something that we talk about a lot in the hall is, you know, we're talking about all these benevolent groups, um, settlement houses, all that stuff. And town hall's history is like wrapped right into that yep. in terms of what the, um, who the intended adults audience 
uh, or what, who these civic classes were really for or intended to be for. It's just kind of interesting. To, I never yeah. really tease it out just in terms of women. Yeah, I was thinking also of Adele Field, right, who is one of the right. founders and I believe is a Christian missionary um, prior to um, returning back to the United States. Um, yeah. So just to your point um, yeah. in terms of religion. In the um, well, I am interested in, you know, here we are, it's 100 years. <laughs> we didn't really get to celebrate much <laughs> because we're all indoors. There probably would have been a great march. Um, but it's 100 years later, but, you know, political action doesn't like end with this. Of course, also not everybody really gets to vote, <laughs> you know, in 2019, 20. But what does political action look like when you don't have access to the ballot? And what does it look like after this 19th Amendment when maybe you do, but political action still continues? So I was wondering if you both, Paula, if you wouldn't mind starting yeah. with that. Sure. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of interested, you know, I always like the hearing about um, how, uh, like what the, how much the electorate changed after um, the 19th Amendment and kind of like thinking about what were, what were all of the obstacles that still remain. I mean, certainly for um, Black women, I mean, I think they're using it where they can, when they can. But of course, we know that well after the um, 19th Amendment, we th there are many Black women who are still not able to fully make use of the of of the 19th Amendment. Um, but I mean, I will say for 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 the people that I look at. Um, there is an enormous amount of activism, political activism that is happening after uh, even, you know, even after the ratification. I mean, I'm, I was thinking about um, the forming of unions, tobacco workers, women women working in, in tobacco in North Carolina, um, uh, factory workers in St. Louis, Missouri, who are working at um, pecan factories, the International Ladies Garment Workers Union in the 1930s. Mm -hmm. um, Dorothy Height, you know, is right. organizing, uh, is engaged in labor protests as a young person. I mean, I'm not even sure, maybe she's 20 already, um, but like, you know, and making statements in front of the New York City Council calling for pay equity and livable wages um, for domestic workers. Um, the Housewives League of Detroit is founded and they've got chapters kind of across the country and they're sort of mobilizing around consumer power and, you know, the kind of identity as, um, uh, you know, to support black businesses, but sort of the identity of um, black women as consumers and the ability to use that. And we're going to absolutely see that play out as we get to like, you know, bus boycott stuff. Um, but yeah, I think that that. Uh, political activism, even despite, you know, or in spite of the ratification and despite the fact that there's so many women who are still not able to make use of it, um, you know, it's, it's huge. I mean, the, the what we know of what we call the civil rights movement really grows out of all of that political activism that happens after the ratification in the 30s and 40s and early 50s. Good. Okay. I was just going to, uh, Paula, I think one of the things that um, your book really draws out is the different ways of, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, of political organizing in DC. Um, and I'd love to uh, not to intervene and uh, take over, but I, I kind of want to make sure that we get to hear some of those uh, mm. stories. And I also say that Paula's book is available on audiobook too. Um, Who's reading it? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> Some very attractive <laughs> actor. I don't know. I like Googled him after I after they told me he was reading, and I was like, this guy. <laughs> because I think I think what you do and what we you've done you've helped me think about is like different forms of activism um, and different uh, ways to embody politics. Maybe is the word. Um, yeah. Well, you know, I mean, I think partly for me, this kind this comes out of Stephanie Camp's work. And I'm trying to remember the name. I mean, maybe her book, I think, is like Everyday People, maybe. I, I could look it up. But, you know, she does this work where she looked at WPA narratives um, and, and really listened to WPA narratives and then wrote about the early uh, 19th century and the institution of slavery and the experience of mostly women in the institution of slavery and really, um, you know, sort of developed this, uh, this, 
methodology around what she called somatic politics and looking at the use of the body. And uh, so I really took that into looking at young people in the late 1930s. So, uh, so, and I, and the way that young people are talking about their understanding um, of themselves physically, right? I mean, these are teenagers who are go also going through puberty and having all kinds of body changes. Uh, who are also in, living inside of a segregated city, but it's a segregated city that is also the capital of the U.S. So it's this it's this huge kind of you know mix of um, of of different pieces of identity in this city that has all of these different kinds of meaning, um, and they're also moving around it in all of these different spaces that have national and international meaning, um, but in many cases they're sort of not allowed to be in those spaces. Uh, so yeah, I, I um, but I know that in the conversations that Lauren and I were having about the use of space, um, the work that Lauren was doing with the women going into these spaces that they were not supposed to be in, and then the young people going into these spaces that they are not supposed to be in, but are, you know, gendered, raced, classed, but also aged, if, if that, you know, like it's mm -hmm. all this added thing of, young people in DC where really nobody has political rights in DC. And then here they are, they're also young people, they wouldn't be able to, to you know, participate in the franchise anyway. So how do they mobilize a political identity, you know, uh, cultivate a political voice? Uh, and then what do they talk about in, in this political voice? So this image is, um, this image is of uh, some young uh, white kids in the Lincoln Memorial reflecting pool. Um, and it's an important image because it's taken at the same time as the interviews that, um, that are being done in Washington, DC in the 1930s of, uh, of teenagers. And I can talk more about that. Uh, but, but basically one of the young people interviewed, um, Susie Morgan, who's 14, talks about um, using the Lincoln Memorial reflecting pool to swim in in the you know the hot and humid summers of Washington D.C. and being she and her friends and being chased out by the police, sort of being harassed and then eventually chased out. But she tells this amazing story about her experiences with cops when they're trying to when the when her and her friends are trying to swim in the Lincoln Memorial reflecting pool where they sort of mobilize, you know, they speak to Lincoln, they mobilize an idea of Lincoln um, allowing them to be in that pool. Uh, they actually like, you know, one of the kids sort of pretends to be Lincoln and kind of speaks to them and says, you can stay and swim as long as you want to. And, you know, and they say, well, Lincoln gave us permission to be in here. So it's this whole understanding of how uh, you know, Lincoln, so sort of mobilizing the idea that Lincoln freed the slaves, right, which is probably part of the narrative at the time about kind of what the end of slavery looked like. Um, but then also identifying the way that Lincoln is, you know, the the their advocate um, and maybe an advocate for black people generally at this moment. Um, and I think the, you know, the Lincoln Memorial and the Reflecting Pool are only maybe 15 years old by the time that they are are playing in it it's you know it was dedicated in 1922. wow wow well paul i've got to ask you about your sources and your archive and putting your work together i mean both of you uh but paul would you take that first because both of these projects when you think especially about mapping suffrage or dealing with suffrage um almost top i don't even know what the word is in terms of topography it's so like topographically <laughs> um <laughs> if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, um, and Lauren and I shared the this the thinking about, um, and Lauren knows this better than me, the um, Jessica Ellen Sewell work that talks about um, these different landscapes, the experienced landscape, the built landscape, and there's always a third one that I absolutely never- Lived. What's it? Lived. Is it lived? Probably. Is it lived? Yeah, that yeah. makes sense, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think no, I'm not 100% sure. Probably, but. That's probably right. but um, <laughs> and so, so my sources were, um, they are all of these uh, interviews done by black sociologist E. Franklin Frazier. While he's at Howard, he um, is working on this project that's funded by the federal government to essentially uh, research young people's um, 
responses to racial segregation. Like what is racial segregation doing to them psychologically? So it's, um, it's called uh, Negro Youth at the Crossways, uh, Adolescent Personality Develop in the Middle States. And it comes out in 1942, but he's doing these interviews. He has a staff of interviewers who are mostly young uh, black people uh, from some from DC, but not all of them. And they are interviewing young people over the course of two years to ask them a bunch of, you know, different kinds of questions. So stuff about their personal lives, but also, you know, sort of what they're learning in school, what their experiences are with white people, you know, what they think about DC, et cetera. And so um, he did over 200 of these interviews and those were really the, the base of my um, archives to, to kind of write these narratives of young people's lived experiences in Washington DC in the late thirties. Uh, and I just remember Paula doing this kind of like impressive, and I, I like still strikes me, and I think I still tell students about it, right? This, you would have like the index cards of the interviews and you would rearrange them to try to foreground the interviewee's voice over the interviewer's voice. Um, like, so really kind of re thinking about the the creation of the archives and whose voices was were intended to be amplified mm -hmm. and how we could kind of use that to amplify actually the people who are being inter interviewed um, is, uh, so do you wanna, uh, and then like the power it's had, the book has had with um, uh, descendants, people who've read it um, since then, um, right? That you've uh, been in contact with. It's true. I did not. I wanted to meet people who were related to the young people in the book. I didn't think that was a real thing that was going to happen. But um, but it has. I mean, not, you know, Susie Morgan, whose experience is the one I just I just talked about in the Lincoln Memorial Reflecting Pool. But one of the young other young people I've I've been in touch with um, his wife, with uh, his uh, cousins. Yeah, it's been kind of amazing. Wow. Yeah, I think really I kind of underscores the importance of the work, yeah. And Lauren, will you talk about your methodology? Sure. Because I don't, yeah. <laughs> she sounds, it looks incredible to me. So I'm like, how did this happen? How did this uh, happen? <laughs> Paula, I feel like you should field that question because you have like dealt with all the frustrations over the last, uh, the the learning curve here. So um, it happened. So I focus on like a handful of suffrage organizations. Um, so again, as I kind of started the conversation by just a, kind of a very small segment of um, uh, a much more diverse and longer uh, struggle for the vote. Um, and I look at um, how these organizations thought spatially. Uh, and it actually struck me, a couple things struck me to think about spatially. One is the book that Paula was just referring to. Two is that I started placing various headquarters on fire insurance maps. Fire insurance maps are, Paula, I mean, how would you describe them? They're like um, maps that are created um, every few years to indicate building materials of the city. And they give you like yeah. a really kind of streetscape view. Um, and I'm less interested if something's made of brick versus wood. I'm more interested in like, oh, there's a church next door or there's mm -hmm. like a department store next door. So I started, um, it, they have street addresses in the suffrage publications and I started mapping them onto um, fire. And, well, at first, just like a random map that I found in a book, just like with a pencil. Uh, and then I was like, oh, there's, <laughs> there's something here. Like I need to come up with a sustained way to pursue this. Um, and I think Paula, you had learned about Digital Harlem somewhere. I mean, maybe they came to the grad center, right? Um, mm -hmm. And so that was on our radar. Um, and uh, so I kind of tried to replicate in parts some of the things they're doing uh, in terms of thinking spatially about everyday experiences. Um, so placing events on fire insurance maps to see what we could uncover about kind of um, uh, about assumptions suffragists are making. Uh, and then I created a map, or I am creating is the better word, uh, a, a digital humanity supplement to the book, Mapping Suffrage, that um, allows users to kind of interrogate suffrage publications to see where, I don't know, the Women's Suffrage Party held their open air meetings at night in 1910. And it'll place mm -hmm. those locations on a fire insurance map. Um, and the benefit of that is that, of course, um, I don't know, trying to think of like one street is very different in 1910 than it is in 
what are we in now? 2020, right? So like <laughs> the contextualization. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I think that's right. Yeah. <laughs> but even, I mean, I think even I remember when you were sort of, you know, moving yeah. kind of through time for in the writing of the book, but even year to year, the yeah. New York City space changed. And so trying to figure out like, why would they make a decision to put a headquarters right. in a certain space yeah. um, in Murray Hill or, you know, so I just remember you having to do some interrogation of what the space looked like at the time in order to write the text. Like, I, and I think, you know, mapping suffrage as a project is kind of a natural outgrowth of the work that you were doing in order to write the text mm -hmm. yeah. to try to figure out what, the, yeah. you know, why, why Wall Street was important, right. you know, why go to a baseball game, you know, why, so all sort of like yeah. thinking about all of those spaces and what those spaces meant. Yeah, and it's interesting, right? Because if we look at, um, sorry, I know we're like over time, so I no, will. No, no. It's okay. it's <laughs> um, like if you look at suffrage publications, um, like the women voter to take one example, it's just the list at the very end of where events are happening, street addresses are happening, or they'll just list where suffrage headquarters are happening. And so there's like, it's like, that's great, but I can't do anything with that in 2020 unless I like actually map these locations and mm -hmm. see what's around them. Um, and once once um, we do, I think we see things that perhaps they saw at the moment and it was just they didn't need to explicitly say, um, or perhaps they, it wasn't as visible to them as it is to us now, I can't say. I think some of it, I think the headquarters locations were, um, so. Well, it's just, you know, for someone outside of the field, um, thinking about or hearing you think openly about space and political action um, and mapping political act action, it also thinking about um, uh, what the lived experience uh, of a, a person who is either taking part in political action or is being served in some way by that. Both of these sort of things that you both are, are dealing with, I feel like, like, yeah, we need to think about history in that way and also what's happening now in that way. So I was hoping that, you know, as we close out, both of you wouldn't mind speaking to what your projects, what your research, what your conversations with each other can, what, the, what, what kind of space do we need to hold? for today, you know, for movements that are, there's several movements at any given time in history, but definitely now a lot, um, you know, what, what, why is this history? Why is your methodology? Why is your approach to this history important for us in understanding where we are today? Well, I mean, I can, I can start mostly just to say that, you know, so almost every semester I teach um, a civil rights history course and we do, we start with, Wells's anti-lynching campaign. We, de we definitely start in the, you know, post-reconstruction period. We talk about the reconstruction amendments and we, we, cur we come to, uh, well, it used to be that we went to Occupy Wall Street, you know, and now we, we come to the Black Lives Matter movement. And um, I think what's been so important to me is to help students. Um, and this is why I think, you know, the work that Lauren does in the book um, is so important because I think looking at social movements historically um, and really understanding kind of what is at the heart, you know, what's what is in the mix for all of these movements, right? We look back on so many movements and think about them as quote unquote successful or not successful. Um, and we have these particular narratives that I think are very limiting and limited. And I, I think I encourage students and, and sort of use, you know, a, a lots of different sources, both secondary and primary sources, to help students see just how really messy these movements were. I mean, one of the things that that I um, that Lauren and I talk about is sort of the debates, you know, the the tensions, the fractures that happen inside of the social movements that we look at, and trying to highlight those because I think if we're able to really understand what it takes for any movement, to culminate in whatever ways um, we understand movements to have culminated, mm -hmm. uh, we need to understand that mo what it looks like inside of those are usually pretty messy. They are not as smooth, right? It is not as clear that something is successful versus not successful, not successful. And there are usually so many th different 
approaches mm -hmm. to the same campaign goal yep. happening simultaneously. And unless we know that to be true, we actually don't know how the outcome came to be. Mm -hmm. hmm. Yeah, I would just, um, I, I think Paula, you said it, um, uh, better than I would say it, um, in that it's like it highlights to us the messiness and the fractures. I'm um, thinking about suffrage and different, like whether they want to focus on the state amendment or a national amendment, right? All of these debates are happening internally. I also think, and we didn't really get a chance to talk about it, um, but um, the different kind of levels of suffrage that existed is a, mm -hmm. a good reminder, like um, voting at local elections or school board elections or municipal elections, right, is um, kind of a key takeaway too. So not only about the 19th Amendment, and there's actually like a great website that I just was reminded of today called Her Hat Was in the Ring that traces um, women's involvement or running for election prior to the 19th Amendment. Um, so a good reminder that even before the 19th Amendment, there's lots of engagement in politics. And I guess the last thing I would say, um, and similar to Paula, I think I think there's uh, there's ways to update this over the last few years, but I used to end my talks on the book with the um, man spreading poster from the, MA, uh, from the MTA, right? From the subway, right? Mm -hmm. So think about the ways in which public space is still not equally public. Uh, um, I don't know if any of you, we probably all remember that, um, those uh, man spreading posters. Um, yeah, I do. MCA, like a few years back, uh, just as like a reminder of the ways uh, in which public space continues to be regulated and policed mm -hmm. um, is worth, I think, considering. And like ways in which um, people navigated around that. Well, yeah, I mean, I think I would definitely want. Oh, um, and gendered, right? Like in that case, right. gendered. Um, sorry. Right. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, Thanks, right. Alex. So there's like all sorts of interest. And I used to be like, there's all sorts of interesting gender things happening here. So like in this case, public space being highly gendered. Um, right. But also policed and regulated. Um, we can think about as well. And some of the movements that we've talked about um, that have dominated, at least in the U.S. in the last 10 years, you know, Occupy, Me Too. Um, of course, you know, the Women's March is another. There's Occupy right there. Um, and of course, you know, Black Lives Matter as being... Uh, really about contested space. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, in each each one in different ways. Yeah, this is released the tapes mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. of a rally in um, Minneapolis uh, after the killing of Jamar Clark. But mm -hmm. you know, thinking about uh, public space, who is allowed to be where? Who who is? Um, how many people are allowed to be anywhere at a certain time? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and, but also about who gets to take up space and be left alone, which is something that, of course, I think a lot of us have been thinking about over this summer. Mm -hmm. um, something right. Else. right. And I think that I would add the criminalization, right? I mean, this right. is one of the things that, um, that Lauren talks about in, in the book, so that there is this kind of, you know, that there are the women who are criminalized for being in those spaces, but then there are the women who also then, you know, kind of demand uh, protection yep. Yep. Um, from from police. And I think that, so, and Occupy is a great example of that, you know, and the, the their, their re-territorialization of what was officially a private, yeah. owned, privately owned space, right? Yep. And the drama around, yeah. around that that happened. But I think, you know, one of the things that comes out of really the late, the movements of the late 1960s and early 70s is a real, is an expansion of our understanding of state violence and what the state is responsible for. I mean, we know that lynching um, was essentially state sanctioned in many cases, right? Many of those lynch mobs were inclusive of, you know, um, sort of officials at the local uh, state level. Uh, and so we we sort of, people knew that those, that those killings were state sanctioned to some extent. But I think um, the late, the movements of the, in the black power era really helped to expand how we think about state violence being inclusive of things like poverty and residential segregation and mm -hmm. right, all of those things. And I think, this summer, um, the kind of, you know, the global pandemic and the combination of, of sort of the racial reckoning protests, bringing all of those pieces together. And, you know, many of us are asking the questions about like, well, what are the responsibility? What, what is the federal government's responsibility, right, at these moments? Um, when all of us are having these, you know, cross states are having these experiences. Wow. 
Oh my gosh, well, I can't wait for Black Ink. Uh, was it um, Mapping Black Lives Matter? <laughs> Movement for Black Lives. Oh, who's doing that project? It's going to be one of Lauren's students. Yeah, though so I don't know how we'll do it, but it's definitely cool. <laughs> yeah. do it. Um, well, yeah, I, one question I just want to ask before we leave is um, anything that you want to say about how over history, um, people have enacted change without the ballot, even though we're going into a season where people will be voting and whatnot. Uh, you have studied people who, who, who were fighting for the right to vote, amongst other things, but also enacted so much change without it. Yeah, I mean, I'm thinking about um, Fanny Lou Hamer, whose birthday it is today. Yeah, uh, I see her. I see her. Oh, no. um, you know, and she started, I mean, of course, we know about her politicization around, you know, herself as a voter, her voter registration, you know, attempts, the, the fact that she loses her job and she loses her home um, because she is a she's a sharecropper. But she starts, you know, and this is, I think, one of the things that we're seeing right now in the midst of the pandemic are these mutual aid societies and the the, the these collective and community efforts to support um, to support folks who are struggling in multiple ways. And Fannie Lou Hamer started um, a uh, sort of food justice initiative in 1967. She started the Food Farm Cooperative, and it was sort of based in uh, collective land ownership. Um, and most of it comes out of the reality that the Department of Agriculture uh, sort of rejected, you know, uh, all of these loans to black farmers and all of these black farmers uh, are losing land essentially between the 1930s in, well into the 1980s. Um, but the, the um, Food Farm Collective ended up, you know, being able to uh, support some 1500 families so it was they were doing food distribution there was housing on the land so i just i think that and i think this is happening right now that we are that this that we know the importance of the ballot right i mean we've had we we, we have all of these people in our history who have fought incredibly hard for access to it who continue to fight and we know voter suppression is very real and we have an equally long history of voter suppression mm -hmm. um and we know that that political action uh, is not exclusive to that, and that most of the activists that Lauren and I talk about are absolutely um, for the franchise, right? Are absolutely proponents of the ballot and the and access to it, and and attempting to expand democracy. And we know that they are doing other kinds of work, community work that is about civic education, political education, but also the support of, of the communities in which they live. Yeah, I would just, um, I would just kind of add on to that. I was thinking a little bit um, about um, kind of what we talked about taking up space uh, and using space to convey messages. Um, also uh, in terms of like, figuring out ways to speak to one another and raise one another's consciousness about um, uh, values that are important to us. Um, I think it's something that suffragists are trying to have to figure out to do in the 1910s is they have to like literally convince men to give up their exclusive power over the ballot, right? And like how that happens, um, those conversations being um, important to, I think, um, consider. Well, we do have to wrap up, but I have to ask each of you, I don't know if you want to answer this question, but what are you working on? <laughs> what are you working on? And also, what are you teaching? Like, what are you teaching this semester? Paul, do you want to go first? All right, go first. It's up to you. I... Uh, okay. Um, so I... Um... I just was fortunate to finish up a NEH fellowship at the New York Historical Society, where I started to think some about uh, the experiences of a few Italian American um, teenagers in the 1920s um, responding to sexual assaults and their kind of resilience and how they navigated uh, 
judicial system that's not really intended to amplify their voices. So that was kind of um, the project I'm moving into and I'm trying to simultaneously finish up the mapping suffrage project. There's a few more, 1915 and 1917 still have to be, the data has to be cleaned, which is a, a tedious process. Um, and um, I'm teaching, I think that was the second question, I, te I teach in the writing program at Princeton and I teach um, a seminar called Deconstructing Gender. Ooh. And I'm hoping someday to work on a digital humanities problem project like mapping suffrage. Uh, Lauren and I have talked about this for years because yes, we we I saw that digital Harlem thing and that was really what I wanted to do. And then I, I did something else. But I've I actually have um, I'm hoping to be able to get some funding in the next year to do uh, something similar to what Lauren's doing um, with the, the data that they have for uh, the suffrage organizations with the young people who were in coming of age mm -hmm. at, to kind of look at their movements, um, to look at the proximity, you know, and, and really to focus on Southwest DC and what Southwest DC looked like before most of it was raised. So that's one of my next projects. The other uh, project is a, a new book project that is going to look at the history of um, self and community care and and self preservation. So really, sort of thinking about you know the the self care hashtag and thinking about how activists in uh, Black women activists in particular have um, have practiced self and community care and uh, uh, an ethics of care while engaged in uh, social just justice activism so that I think because I think actually we need some lessons for what self and community care look like. Um, I think some of the things that we're advocating um, are maybe, you know, uh, are a little bit performative. I mean, and now I'm going to get like hate mail. But um, <laughs> but yeah, I, I would like to just draw some lessons from history to kind of help us figure out what self and community care could look like right now. Well, those are both incredible projects. Um, but you also, you know, you're good at lifting other folks' work up too. You gave us some book recommendations of books that are, uh, have all been released. That you told us about Vanguard. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so that is something that I guess I'll be picking up. Uh, and then also, a, what is it, A Black Woman's History mm -hmm. of the United States? Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, I'll be, I'll be borrowing that from you. And then recasting the vote. Yep. I think Happy that one, uh, yeah, the Cahill one is the, I think the very, the most recent. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, Martha Jones is super recent, but I think this one might be the last couple of weeks too. Well, I mean, I'll, I guess I'll send my bill to you. <laughs> <laughs> is that how it works? <laughs> no, no, it's not. Okay. <laughs> so I'm not getting the, the big, the big store discount. Um, <laughs> No, thank you so much. It's such a lovely evening. I'm so happy that you chose to spend it with us and that we got to witness your rapport. <laughs> so I'm really... We were really so well behaved. Much. I just want to make yeah, that. This I was <laughs> really well behaved tonight. Yeah. That's true. That's a fair um, assessment. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah, is there anything else you want to say before I just, you know, touch the hem of your garment and thank you? Thank you. No, thank you. Thank you for and having us. And thank everyone who was here with us right. tonight. Virtually. Yeah, virtually. And we'll yep. also, for anyone who couldn't make it today, we'll be posting this on our uh, YouTube channel. We'll figure out a date for a live premiere. So just look out on our newsletter. Join our newsletter if you aren't already on it. Uh, check our website for any updates. We've got two more programs in the next week. Um, on Thursday, we'll be looking at Bloody Town Hall. Town Bloody Hall, which was an event with Norman Mailer and four incredible feminists um, on the town hall stage. And the Criterion Collection just re-released and reissued um, the DVD of the uh, document documentary about the film, about the evening. So there's that. And then next Tuesday, we are lucky to have Ricky Riccardi from the Louis Armstrong House Museum and Brad St. Martin from the Apollo speaking with us about Louis Armstrong's move from the big bands and the Apollo to Town Hall and the Officers. So we'll be looking at Satchmo's kind of like a 15 year period of his career that often isn't talked about. So uh, come and join us for those two. There are so many more programs, so just keep checking up on us. 
Um, I want to thank our guests once more. It was such a pleasure. I'm going to be watching this one because there's a lot that I don't think I caught. Um, and uh, yeah, everyone, please keep keep up with us. If you'd like to support the town hall and programs like these, please go to townhall.org backslash donate and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you. Mm-hmm.